Hello and welcome everybody to our VR and police training webinar. We're happy that you're all here. And I will start with a short introduction and then I hand over to our speakers today. At first, I would like to um, show you the upcoming webinars. This one is the VR police training webinar, it's the first one from a whole series. And the registration for the three other webinars is open now. Uh, the, all of them will be presented by top class experts in their respective area. And now I will shortly introduce the speakers who will present the webinar today. This is my colleague, Markus Murtinger, project coordinator of ShotPros, and Sebastian Egerlampe, scientist at the AIT. If you require further information, Project, you can find them online and you can also ask questions during the webinar and we will try to answer all of them. Enjoy the webinar. Enjoy the webinar. Thank you very much, Valerie, for the introduction. Uh, my name is Markus Murtinger and my colleague Sebastian Eckerlampert. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much. So thank you very much that you join us and everything is live. So if there are any problems or mistakes or, for example, audio connection problems, you can use the chat in our system where you can enter some messages. But also, if there are any questions regarding our topic, use the chat. Valerie will collect all the questions or will also interrupt us that we can give you some more information. For us, it's sometimes very, it's not, it's not easy for us sometimes uh, to go in every of the steps very deep. And so I think it's sensible if you have questions to ask them and we can, of course, discuss them together. Maybe I will start a little bit uh, with, with our project. Um, our project Shot Pros is an European project which is funded by the European in Union, um, and the target group we have, or the main topic we have, are the street patrol officers across Europe, especially and especially the daily challenges, the daily challenges on the on the street. And the idea behind Shot Pros, when we started for approximately two years, uh, also writing the, the idea was that there you have the situation that police officers are coming more and more. To threatening situations. You have different uh, risks with different breaches, for example, crime, terrorism, terrorist attacks, but you also have uh, issues like CBR and e threats and radicalism. And this was so the background and the challenge why we started Shot Pro. On the other hand, because of this rising crime, because of these problems with the mentioned topics, um, you have to high level stress, stress, common stress, because you very often have this which maybe starts very easily, maybe not very dangerous and completely turning in a dangerous scenario, for example, uh, at the terrorist attack. This was the two, this points, was the two points that really distracted the situation. You have the increasing stress and the performance pressure of the police uh, officers, where we started to discuss what are the most important points for these officers. And what, and what we detected uh, writing during our, our idea down was the topic of decision making and acting. Which means when you come to a dangerous situation, a situation where you are very under stress, a high pressure, and you have, uh, and you have to make decisions within seconds, then it's often very, very, uh, not very easy for the person to make a decision and to make a very fast decision and also a correct decision. And this is the main topic we have in Shot Cross to train uh, police officers how they can decide, act correctly, act in the situation, and this under the stressful situation. And the second part of our idea was then when you have this decision making on acting topic, uh, how you can train it, which technology can support this, was then that we really focus on the topic of virtual reality, because virtual reality, and there we will learn today a lot, especially from Sebastian who is that also the technical coordinator in the project, how virtual reality can support this training, which possibilities you have in the virtual room, uh, what is the main advantage of especially training this DMA topic. And so we'll jump a little bit more deeper. I mentioned it, it's an, an, an Europe Horizon project, uh, which was founded in the year uh, 2019 in May, which means we are now at the half time of our project. We had really 18 great months together in our consortium where we had the several research questions, but also the practical questions. And I also think for today, it's very interesting to discuss these practical questions, especially with you as a law enforcement member and the law enforcement community, 
but we still have, and this is always to mention, 18 more months to go much deeper in the topic and also to develop the different things. What we will develop, I will also present. Maybe some wordings about our, our project and project partners, because I think it's very useful for you also to understand this mixture of different disciplines, of different law enforcement agencies, also of different requirements we have. Uh, on the one hand, maybe we'll jump there. Uh, on the one hand, we have, and this is the most important part in our project, we have six European countries and we have six European different law enforcement agencies with very different requirements on the one side because your cultural aspects, you have the different laws in the different European countries. For example, we have the police of North Rhine-Westphalia and the police of Berlin from Germany. Uh, in Belgium, I think this is also quite interesting. We have the crisis center, which have really a strong focus to the CBRNE topic because also this is for us a subtopic especially we will come then later to the different scenarios, to the different situations uh, where police officers are confronting with, with, with danger. And so we also focus on this area. We also have the police of Sweden and our colleagues from Romania. This is so a little bit the, the picture uh, because everything what we're doing in short pros is really focusing on the end user. And the end user is in our case, the law enforcement uh, officers. Um, and so everything we are doing, and we will learn it in our next webinars, especially for the topic of requirement image, uh, management, uh, <laughs> how you conduct, because I think, and this is an also a topic we have later on, is that requirements and to know the requirements for the training, for the virtual reality, for the setup, for the whole environment is the most important thing. Because what we really very often see, a, a thing we have in all our projects, is, is the problem you're doing something technology-like, but you have not the focus on the persons. The users, yeah. And so put the users in the center, put the layers in the center is one of our highest research, research goals. Also what I think is quite interesting, so I am from Muscle and Sebastian from the AIT, much more the technology side, we have more the, 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 the user side to bring in your project. Other partners are, for example, the Kau Leuven, where we really have the topic of criminology, collecting the requirements, and also that all our solutions, and I think this is also a quite interesting point, is that they're correct from the law and correct from the ethical, uh, ethical points. And I think also to mention, of course, the Freie Universität Amsterdam, they have a really strong focus on training. They have a long experience in training of police officers. And also this is for us a really quite interesting approach because what, what we also compare in short pros to, to gain new knowledge or to get a new knowledge is how is the training at the moment, especially for decision making and acting, and how we can transform this in a virtual room and what you can learn and what are the advantages in this virtual reality. And then also uh, to mention Campus Wester, which is a training center uh, in, in Belgium. Also there we have a lot of experience in how to conduct trainings, how to set up this, how to make end user management and the University of Heidelberg, uh, which supports us, especially the research of stress from not in psychology, uh, from a physiological point. Yeah. <clears throat> this is a little bit just that you get the feeling. So today in our first webinar, this was the reason why we introduced it. We lie on, I will mention also later, because there we have some, some screenshots, especially when we come to the VR point, because we lie on is our technology partner. <clears throat> um, what does we deliver? Or what was the idea of our short cross project? As I mentioned, the first interesting thing is it's really focusing on the topic of training for decision making on acting, but not the normal decision making on acting. Really, the focus on a police officer is in a very dangerous situation, has a high pressure, is under stress, is maybe in a scenario which is switching from a normal uh, situation to a very dangerous situation. For example, when weapons are used, when kids are in the scenario, then you really have this changing. Yeah. Um, and there we would wanted to, to build up this training system. This was the idea, like I mentioned, with the enhanced, also we're always talking about enhance the actual training with virtual reality, because it's always a mixture. And I think you will tell a little bit and about Perhaps it. also like one, one thing, Marcus, I, I think also like what's, what's important to mention is like here, the title of the project is Shop Pros, right? Yeah. And but the, the, the project itself is rather about decision-making and acting. And I think that also shows already how we, acted in a, let's say, user-centered, <clears throat> law enforcement agency-centered fashion, because we came up as researchers with the idea to do some, let's say, shooting-oriented training in VR, 
But by talking to the law enforcement agencies throughout the proposal process, we understood that shooting is not the right thing to train, that there is a much, much more important thing, and it's about decision-making and acting. And that's where we changed our focus and really engaged also with Freie Universität Amsterdam, with Raoul, in order to set up a training, uh, a training environment, training curriculum that really focuses on this decision-making and acting, which is the most important prior thing before you get to the decision to shoot, right? That was Absolutely. just something to shortly add. No, perfect. Thank you very much, Sebastian. I'm absolutely right, because everyone is thinking of shot pros is the focus of shooting. Yeah. But for us, it's interesting the situation before. Then you have to make the decision, because not always shooting is the decision. It's always the decision, will I enter the room? Will I close the door? Will I ask questions? Will I maybe stand back? And all this decision-making process is a quite interesting point. <clears throat> and we are always calling it on which artifacts you make the decision. What really decides you uh, to enter this room or not? Or maybe uh, to use your, your, your walkie-talkie and to get support from your colleagues. Um, also, what we would like to deliver, and I think this is maybe also interesting for the community today, is validated guidelines for VR training. Because there is a, a lack of research in what you can really train, how you can train this, uh, what are the real benefits, and how you have to set up a VR training. Because it's always very technology-like, but like I mentioned, sometimes the user is missing, or also the implementation, how you have to change training plans, for example. And this is also where we put the focus our, in our next month. And what we also deliver, and this is one of the reasons why we also conduct this webinar, is when there stands European, I also think we have today some colleagues from non-European countries. Uh, but our goal is to create a network, a community, uh, to discuss these police and VR topics. Also, we will also come later a little bit on, on, on this topic, but maybe just one or two sentences or ideas we have. Uh, what we learned in the last 18 months is almost every police organization is talking about virtual reality and is talking about new possibilities, is talking mm -hmm. also about digitalization topics. How can we make better training, faster training, with less effort, with better usage of resources? And there's very often the, the, the keyword, let's do it with VR. But we think we have so many points for the virtual reality that we have to discuss, that we have to know also what is missing at the moment, in the, in, in, especially in the European Union, is a knowledge platform and knowledge sharing between the different European police forces. Also, I had a lot of talks with the German police, the Austrian police, also with the Romanians, with Albania, where always was everyone is thinking on VR but they're not putting together their knowledge. And also, for example, every country is developing their own scenarios. Yeah. And I think this is always the problem when everyone develops the same, then you have 100 of the common and not maybe the right one. And also this is especially for the European network, one of our large goals we have. Three points what we really have as a goal from ShotPros. Also we would like to improve the performance of the police officers and especially in three situations. One, keep the guidance in dangerous situations, which means you have the power, you have the power over the situation, you control the situation, and you get not, for example, uh, paralyzed. Because this sometimes happens when you're under stress, that you're really losing the focus, mm -hmm. and this is one of the key issues of the training. Also the topic of avoid collateral damage. What happens in the environment if you are in a dangerous scenario? how you can protect, for example, civilians. Do you see some artifacts of the collateral damage? And in the last step, avoiding cascading effects, because what we think and what we also found in the research, when you make one wrong decision, then it's wrong. Yeah. It runs. Then it runs. In the wrong direction, unfortunately. Absolutely. And this is also something we, we would like to train. And also you can go train in the VR, because there you have the complete scenario and you really see one bad decision in the beginning, maybe completely shift everything. So for example, I had with, with a Scandinavian police officer a long discussion about this cascading effect. And there was a lot of studies when you, for example, uh, put out too early your gun, then of course the complete scenario is going in another direction and you can never come back. It's very hard, you can never say, okay, I will put in my gun and say, everything okay. And I also think this is a, a nice possibility of training in the VR because you can train these different scenarios, these different exits of the scenario, and maybe there are different ways how you can interact in the situation and also make 
the right decisions. Let's jump a little bit deeper in the project. Maybe first, um, we have five main objectives. And also, if you have any questions to the objectives, please always ask us. The things we would like to do or what we need for all these questions we discussed on the one hand is a validated human factors model. I know it sounds a little bit too much research, but sometimes you need research. Uh, <laughs> but in the meaning of which human factors are relevant, how you can train this, uh, maybe if you will say two or three sentences to the human factors model. Yeah, Sebastian. I think it is really important to understand what does influence the humans most, or the, I mean the human, the police officers in that in that respect is of course the human, and to understand okay how how are these factors then um, accumulated, right? Because if you're, for instance, if you are a family father, you have kids, then of course you might already have the tendency to react differently in situations where there are kids around, right? And to understand all these influences also in terms of in terms of um, um, skin color whatsoever. And also I think nowadays, of course, we all know about um, uh, terrorism, radicalization, also to bring these these effects into, right? The, the, let's say the appearance of perpetrators, of victims, how that influences in the end of decisions. That's, let's say, this, uh, that's contained in this first, um, in this first objective we want to, we want to solve. And that, but I think there's also uh, another webinar coming up next with, uh, Raoul, uh, Raoul from the Freie Universität in Amsterdam, who will go a bit more into deep, uh, deeper into details in, in this direction. So, yeah. that's it. Thank you very much. No, I think this always helps when we talk yeah. about the topics, <laughs> that we switch a little bit. Now, I think on the one hand, we have this human factors model. Then we know, for example, there was one of the questions, which are topics which are very dangerous for police officers from the feeling? Which are things where he get maybe uh, unround in, in the meaning of not have not the power over the situation. Uh, on the other hand, or the second objective we have is the VR training environment, which VR is, is meaningful, which VR you can use, which technical components are interesting. Also, also what we learned, and this was also interesting for us, that everyone discussed in the beginning of a VR, always the graphical. And compare it, for example, on my PlayStation, everything is better, why it's not in a professional training simulation. So we really do not have the technical focus in this project, but what we would like to know is which things are important for VR training. Is it really the graphical issues or is it the possibilities? Sebastian will then tell a little bit about the guidelines, if you need multiplayer or not, if you have artificial intelligence as an avatar, an opponent in the scenario. This is all in the topic of training and environment. Uh, like Sebastian mentioned, uh, Raul will talk uh, later on in our next or in one of our next webinars about the training framework. This is also a question we receive very often. How you can now train this VR? Is, tra is VR training only enhancing the existing training or is it instead of the existing training? Are there different ways, uh, for example, of the repetition mode? Have you trained in VR every week or once a year? or what are the really advantages and there we would like to build up a framework and a curriculum how you can integrate virtual reality training in the actual training plans also therefore we also conducted an, 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 an comparison of our six police uh, law enforcement agencies what is actual in the trainings plan and how you can integrate later on the vr training and the last point i mentioned it a little bit is the guidelines for vr training and of course our european network but let's jump to some questions we also had in our project and I will then hand over to Sebastian to answer them a little bit. I think the main questions we received also in the last weeks from the, from the police community was really the question of, is VR training appropriate for police training? Can we use VR training and if yes, why? And what is the big benefit? On the second hand, and this was also quite interesting for us, like you mentioned, the shooting topic. Yeah. For which training areas is VR training uh, appropriate? Can I train communication skills, uh, shooting skills, accuracy, but maybe this is our topic, also social behavior, because decision making and acting is a kind of behavior. I get an input, I react. And the last main question also for the day is what has to be considered and what is relevant to introduce VR training? Uh, maybe also tips for you. What are the points you have to think over in the beginning and not later on. What is really so the requirements, and also Emma will talk about in her webinar about it, about these main things. And so Sebastian, I ask you for the for the first question. Yeah. Thanks, Marcus. 
So, I mean, the first question is like, is VR training appropriate for police training or not? I mean, I think to answer that question, it's also important to see, okay, how is current police training built up, right? So, typically what you have for, for, for police students is that you have classroom training, that's of course then included, then you have some weapon handling training, that's also, I think, straightforward. You have scenario training, which is important because I think that's where you train how you should act then uh, on service. On the other hand, scenario training, for instance, now is like, of course, it's contained in the uh, in the study plans or in the training curriculum, but only to a small extent because the reason is it's quite expensive, time-consuming, and yeah, that's why it's not it's not so so intense. And then, of course, typically you also have training on service, right, where you are running as a student with um, with experienced police officers in daily services already and get acquainted with all the situations you might encounter. And I think. If you think about this puzzle and this, this picture, then you cannot just exchange like one of these puzzles and just replace it with VR training because I, that's that's what I brought us to the thing. I mean, we, we think it's a, or at least we we learned over the last uh, last 18 months that this is really a, an an addition, right? It's a complement, but it's not something that can replace anything, right? I mean, I've talked about the scenario training before. I mean, VR training can be a sort of scenario training. It can. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, you cannot replace the real scenario training, which is done in real world. Of course, understood, it's like, it's complex. You have to build rooms, you have to build flats, you have to enter that. You cannot change that very often in the scenario training. On the other hand, that's of course an advantage of VR training, right? So if you have people which have been already in a scenario training, have learned how to act in reality with their colleagues, then of course VR training would be a very good complement in order to do that in a more frequent, uh, frequent frequent fashion. Mm -hmm. And I think also that it's, it's a great compliment, but I think we will also now go a bit to, into the details what VR training means and why you have to rethink training a bit, right? Because just like doing um, something in real world, what, you, what you're doing now in training, you cannot virtualize that into something which is VR training, right? Mm -hmm. You really have to think, okay, what can I do? What can I do not? I have two pictures here you can see on the screen. On the left, you see somebody, um, engaging uh, with a suspect. Um, it's a NATO mission uh, in Afghanistan. And that's something, for instance, that's something you cannot virtualize, right? Mm -hmm. Because you don't have the right precision of, uh, of, of, um, uh, of engaging, of even uh, like having the other person which you want to touch. And uh, that's impossible, right? On the other hand, also like what you see on the right side, that's of course, an, let's say a physical attack and you have to stand by as a police, uh, as a police squad. Also, this is something, I mean, of course, you can do kind of a simulation of that, but get, getting that, say, the physical feedback, what's happening in such a situation, if somebody's jumping on your shield whatsoever, that's something which is very hard to virtualize. And that's, I think, it's the message I want to convey here. I think it's really important to rethink training mm -hmm. and not to go and say, okay, I have a training curriculum I have nowadays, or I have now in my, in my uh, organization, and that's, I want to virtualize 100%, because that is costly. Mm -hmm. because the technical fidelity is very very hard to achieve and in the end it, you, there are certain things you cannot train well and then you don't have the results you want and you have to invest a lot of money. So I think it's really important to think and to rethink okay um, how can I use it best and one, uh, one example here is also that you have some disadvantages in VR which you can then turn into something uh, more advantages. So um, okay there is a this, um, something slightly wrong here, but on the left hand, you can see the, the, bl the blind person. Why do I show that? If you're in VR, you have the headset on, right? Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be able to see Marcus exactly, right? Of course, I have some uh, some other avatars which I see, but it might be that Marcus is standing two meters in front of, uh, aside from me or one and a half meters, right? So I, I cannot rely fully on seeing the person I'm acting in. Uh, I'm in the scenario with as, as my teammate. On the other hand, also spatial audio is not always perfect in, in VR systems, so even hearing is not very is not clear, right? But if you and I mean most of you all in the audience most probably know, um, going or uh, let's say acting, moving uh, in such situations or in, in, in scenarios, it's important to have bodily proximity, right? And there it's important, and that's something you can train ex uh, extremely well because if you don't exactly see the other person, then you can touch her, you can go back to back and then move together. And that's also something which can be a training objective and can be a skill you want to train. And therefore VR training is perfect, right? So originally we would say, oh, it's, it's not so perfect because it's not precise in seeing the other person whatsoever, but you can use that 
to, to make a training which is really uh, aiming at uh, proximity and proximity movement together as a squad, as a team. I think that's also something we've learned that there are some some things you can really use well to train certain certain skills. On the other hand, of course, the question is like, okay, what training objectives, what training areas can you do well? So we have here this table which lists uh, a number of training objectives, which I think are rather universal to most uh, of, of the curriculums in, in police training anyways. And on the right hand, you see the practica uh, practicability in VR, right? So there it's, it's, it's slightly, let's say, mixed. Not all of it uh, can be trained well. So you can see, for instance, here, shooting and weapon handling, right? Aiming at the target, um, then even like having the original weapon, all these things, the sensor motoric, um, let's say memory in, in, in handling your weapon. These are things which can, at the moment, and I think within the next five years, perhaps even 10 years, not, tra not, not being trained extremely well, right? Mm -hmm. Because especially for aiming, if you have this headset, that's something where precision and accuracy you need for shooting, then that's something you cannot, you, you cannot reach easily. Physical fitness also an example, right? I mean, physical fitness with the goggles on, if you're sweating a lot, then you have fog on. So these are things which I would see currently is not very good. On the other hand, they have communication skills, right? So communication skills, I think it's a very important uh, skill in, in policing anyways, because that means de-escalation, right? What is the first step of de-escalation? Typically, it's, it's communication, right? So you have to talk to, uh, to a perpetrator, you have to talk to victims, you have to talk to other people. And that's something, and here's a plus and a minus. If you think about now, we have an AI engine which is doing the perfect communication with you. I would say that's probably also five to 10 years ahead. I, I don't see it here. But on the other hand, you can trick the system, right? If you have a role-playing character, that's like an avatar, which is uh, a real person acting as, a, um, as, as, the, as the avatar and then speaking for the avatar, then you can do a communication skills and the communication training extremely well, right? Because then you have another, person, it ideally a trainer, which then reacts and triggers the right, uh, the right reactions. So that's something which can be really trained well. And what we also learned um, from the VR trainings, we, we, we have been participating in the, last, uh, in the last 18 months, and I think we got lots of, uh, let, let's say, lots of hands-on experience, uh, hands experience. I think we didn't mention it, right? We had like yeah. one big study uh, with the <coughs> Dutch police with about 300 um, uh, police officers being in, tra in VR training and, and, and working with us, and then also these the, the, the colleagues from the uh, from the Stadtpolizei Zürich. Mm -hmm. They are also I think we had approximately 800 um, officers training in VR. We made interviews with them, questionnaires, and we identified that, for instance, law and regulations knowledge is something which can be trained extremely well in VR, and that was something which at least me surprised a bit. But on the other hand, you. You have theoretical classroom training about law, about regulations, how to follow them. But then you have transfer. You have to transfer this th theoretical knowledge into practical knowledge, into acting, and that's something which extremely uh, works extremely well in VR because because you can have lots of different scenarios where you have to follow these law and regulations, and then you can do this after action reviews, right? You can see yourself how you acted, and you can identify where you did wrong. And then I think for learning, training, that's really, that's, that's, that's perfect. So that's, let's say, our first, <clears throat> our first results after the 18 months, what you can do well, what you can train well, and what not so well. I think you, you, <clears throat> you mentioned two interesting points. Also, they are also interested. Um, you observed a lot of these trainings. Yes. Uh, or you was involved in them. Um, just not only from a scientific background, from your personal point of view, what was really good in the training, or was it accepted from the police officers? I think what uh, what they accepted really well was that they could train situations which are currently not well trainable. Okay. And that um, what they also saw, of course, which they also know from real trainings, but what they didn't expect from VR, mm -hmm. that let's say teamwork, being there as a team is is still extremely important. So also there, okay. I think that came up came out from them that they have to act as a team. And that's mm -hmm. what I said before already, like this proximity, right? You could also, um, if just like looking at those people running around in a space where there's nothing, right? Because if I'm out of the VR and watching those police officers training jointly, I just see people moving, but I of course don't see the scenario they're in. Mm -hmm. But you could immediately identify teams which are working together in a very good fashion and those mm -hmm. which are not. Okay. Not the watching at the behavior, 
even not knowing what they are in which situation they were, mm -hmm. you could immediately see where teamwork is going well and not. And maybe one additional question, because I, I received it a lot of, in, in, in my one-to-one -one discussions with different police organizations. Take the police officers the VR training serious. Also, in the meaning of it's all everything just a game, or you have such a high experience and an immersion that you say, no, it's it's training. No, that's a very good point. I wouldn't say that the percentage of those officers taking it seriously is 100%, but it was mm -hmm. a very high percentage. Mm -hmm. I mean, what we witnessed also was, of course, that we had some kind of acceptance issues with um, police officers of a higher age age bracket. Okay. That because they were not so familiar with with VR anyways and so on. So there was a bit of an acceptance issue with mm -hmm. those people. Mm -hmm. But in general, um, I think they accepted it really well. Mm -hmm. I mean, what we also had, like in one of the in one of the studies, was that we had a pain stimulus in addition, mm -hmm. um, everything ethically approved, of course. And but I think it was also interesting to see because the, even the feedback from them or from the from the trainees, they told us just the knowledge of pain stimuli being in addition there also increased the realism, even if they didn't uh, didn't sense the pain at all mm -hmm. in the training because there was no no situation where they were around it whatsoever. But just knowing that increase the realism and I think mm -hmm. that was really 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 interesting to see mm -hmm. because that's uh, something how, where you can see how this, the use or at least the, the knowledge of a technology that could be used in such a scenario can change the mm -hmm. way they immerse into the situation mm -hmm. and I think that was really really important to see yeah. interesting to see because I think this is quite interesting a point because in the beginning of our project we had sometimes especially management level of the police these discussions of is VR training really a training yeah. or is it like a computer game? So the police officers come, it's like playing on the PlayStation. You play something, but you do not learn it. So more an entertainment than really an, an, an police training. Yeah. And so I think it, it's, it's quite interesting also for our audience today that yes, we see in reality, not maybe 100%, but a really high percentage that they take it serious, yeah. that it's really, it, we are, can be a part of VR training, uh, of training of police, and the VR is, is therefore useful. Yeah. So I think this is really interesting point and also one of our first main findings in this, eight, in this first 18 months, because it was always discussed so long. Is it just a technology? Is it a game? Is it entertainment? Um, and I think from now a day we can really say, no, it's part of the training, it can be training, and everyone takes it, yeah. everyone, almost everyone takes it serious. Yeah. And I think you exactly have that also with a scenario training, in real, uh, with real scenario training, right? That you have a certain percentage of people which say, okay, it's not real, right? So, yeah. I mean, I think that's that's absolutely okay. I mean, perhaps then let's say to sum up a bit, uh, what was our, our, what has to be considered, what's relevant for the introduction of VR training. So that's a bit of a learning we have from this, eight, mm -hmm. from this first 18 months. And I think, I mean, you see it here by these, by these, by, by these bullet points, Multiplayer ability, I think that's something which is ultimately important mm -hmm. because uh, also what we, I mean, you all know that of course, but the minimal police team setting is a, is, a, is, a, is a team of two people, right? So you have to have two people in the training in order to be able to train things well, right? So multiplayer ability, I think if, if you don't have that, then single, let's say single player or single trainee um, settings, I think it's not very, it's not very appropriate. On the other hand, I mean, that was also something which was, of course, in the beginning, a bit of a fear of, of some of the uh, layer partners about the trainer role, if, if that's needed, or if you have then some automatic training which is running and that people are doing things in a wrong fashion and then that there's no trainer which interrupts mm -hmm. them, right? I think that's, that's, that's definitely um, wrong, this fear, because I think you really have to rethink the role of the trainer, right? Mm -hmm. You definitely need the trainer, and a good trainer will still be the most important um, person or thing in order to have good training, right? To have to control the training in a good fashion, to act well, to uh, adapt the scenario in a proper mm -hmm. way, and also to give feedback then in the after action review. So I think the trainer, you have to rethink the role of the trainer, but it's extremely important. Yeah, maybe just one sentence because. Sure. Also, Maybe you have another opinion, but I think especially you mentioned it, the rebriefing. It's one of the most interesting points of VR. Because on the one hand, you have in comparison to the real training a really viewpoint of the trainee, yeah. because you have the recordings. Also you really see what what saw the trainee, 
what was the interesting points. What we also do in Shot Pro is, for example, measurement stress and, and, and different uh, bio, bio signals during the training. This is also maybe interesting for the trainer because he sees what was the stressors, what was the interesting point in this scenario, and maybe there was, when we come back to the decision making on acting, and maybe a wrong decision, and you see it from the bio signals that the police officer was very stressed. In the normal training, you just guess it. But I think this is interesting for the rebriefing, and this is also a point we have in Shot Pros now for the next month, is to think over this rebriefing. How does a rebriefing session look like? Yeah. Do you replay the video? Do you replay the experience? Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I, I think that's that's a very important thing, right? Because the after action review or something that you get kind of get for free, kind of in VR, right? Mm -hmm. Because if you do real, real, real world training, and you also um, have participated there, you have people which are filming the situation, right? Mm -hmm. You have one, two people with cameras. You later on have to go through. It's very how to say very cumbersome. It takes lots of resources. And you don't have the view of the training, but yeah. here you have the view of different trainees. You have a top-down view, and I think also for the people to see and for the trainees to see how they acted if they did something wrong, and perhaps also to think about why why they did it. Mm -hmm. I think that's that's really important, and I think this after-action review possibility that's something which is really a very unique asset of VR, and uh, makes it extremely helpful for learning, understanding, and improving in your personal um, decision making and acting skills. Mm, absolutely. Definitely. Maybe just one sentence. Also, also Raul will talk there a lot about, about this, how we can train for decision making and acting. But I think you mentioned one of the most interesting things, and this is one of the advantages of the VR system, is that you can review your own behavior. Yeah. Because I have the, the recordings of the VR. I have the recordings of the VR from different positions, because I have my own position and see how I behave. On the other hand, I also see a neutral view. What was my behavior, what my decision? And this is also one of our key points in, in, in Shot Pros, where we say this learning from your own behavior and to, 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 to get back in time and to see, ah, there was a decision because maybe sometimes we do not know that I, I make decisions every second. But then it's interesting to see yeah. your own behavior, decision, decision, decision. And like we mentioned before, maybe there was one, one wrong decision and then the whole scenario was changed. completely different and changed. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think this is also quite an interesting point from this after action review. Yeah, you learn from your own behavior and you see your own behavior. And of course you need the, the, the game together with, with the trainer because the trainer can then also say, look, there was your behavior. And so I'm completely on your side, we have to rethink the role. We have of course, or we need in the future, of course, trainers who can train for the VR. Also, you also need the, the, the new practices, new models, and this is the reason why we will establish this framework. Yeah. Oh, sorry, yeah. Sebastian. No, it's perfect, perfect. Well, um, I think like another point we also understood is that content is very important, right? Yeah. All the, let's say, the different scenarios you have in the VR, and that's probably even more important than having the perfect hardware, right? Because if you talk about hardware, and as Marco said in the beginning, right, everybody says, yeah, but graph the graphics have to be perfect, pixel perfect, because I know it from my PlayStation. Sure, you know, because like over there is, totally different, let's say, resources are put into gaming, right? Mm -hmm. What you have, what you can then afford in your, in your VR, VR, VR training um, system, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the, the content, the scenarios, what you can train, what, how you can configure those scenarios, I think that's extremely important. Also like then um, getting in the, your perfect, your personal weaponry, right? I know that's important for police officers, right? To have their, their own weapons. Mm -hmm. Having your own um, blue weapons probably is not a, is not a big issue, but having them perfectly represented in the VR system then in the graphics, that's another topic, right? So the sensor motoric handling, that's fine if you use your blue weapon, but then getting that perfect into the VR, I think at, at least that's what we learned in the last 18 months. That's something was probably at the moment is not the way to aim for because that's extremely costly. Mm -hmm. And then you still have don't the precision, you don't, you don't have the precision accuracy you need for shooting, right? Mm -hmm. So that's something. So I would, why I say content is the most important thing, and you have you have to have scenarios with, or the, tra the scenarios you want to train to get them in easily. I think that's pretty important. I mean, um, there's a question. Okay, so we have to bring up the questions. Just reading the question that's because okay. we have enough time. So the question is like, will you uh, be able to introduce some different factors, right? Not just people. Um, 
and looking for a suspect and deciding whether to send my talk first. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, th I think that's uh, that's a very valid question, right? Because like um, making scenarios um, dynamic, I think that's an important thing. And that's why I said before also that uh, you have to rethink the, the, the role of the trainer, right? Because currently if trainers are participating in a scenario, they're typically acting, right? And they can only change their, let's say they're acting themselves and their appearance. But are in such a in such a training setting, you could introduce artifacts or changes of the situation, which are then or could could change the way the way which is acted. So I think yes, you you should have or that what we have seen as a, as a good way forward is that you have some kind of a list of different um, behaviors of different artifacts you can bring in, and that you can then can place them into the VR while the training is running. On the other hand, also another option would be is or is a role player, which is uh, let's say invisible, right? But can then appear as an actor or as a perpetrator or as a suspect, victim, whatsoever, somewhere can talk to you, right? And I think that's that's also um, a pretty pretty good way to go forward. Uh, yeah, I think that's at least from my point would go mm -hmm. on to that question. Maybe we'll answer one of the other questions at this yeah. moment because it fits very well. Um, the question about if we think there should be VR training centers in Europe or every police should have. Also, in our opinion, but this is really now uh, after 18 months and we are not at the end of our journey. Um, also, from my opinion, no, there should be not one training center in the European Union. There should be the different training systems at the different police uh, law enforcement agencies in Europe. Maybe they also have special needs or something like this. Maybe Belgium is a little bit different from Sweden. What I think, and this is also another project we are working at the moment in the CBRNE area, is much more the, the topic of sharing content, for example. Yeah. Also, I think it's, it's senseless, it's my opinion, if every country creates very similar scenarios, yeah. invest really a lot of the money. So, for example, with every country I talk, they, they, they wanted to have a an, an scenario at an airport. A typically uh, terrorism attack at an airport, and there I think uh, this is very sad about the resources because if everyone is working on the same scenario and not sharing it. So yeah. from my feeling and also from the network idea, it would be more the wish that we have, for example, an, an content exchange where you share, for example, between the Belgium and the German police, the contents and the experiences and say, okay, there's one scenario. Maybe this scenario has to be adopted. Also, this can always be that it looks a little bit different, that the designs are different, that the language is different, for example, but then you really have maybe 10% of work and not really to start from the scratch on. I also think this is what we discussed a lot at the moment at Shoto, how to design good scenarios for this training. I also think this is an experience, also this is what Short Pros is trying in the next 18 months, how we can share these experiences we now have. Yeah. What makes a good scenario to a good scenario? Also, for example, also with the Belgian Crisis Center, we are discussing at the moment how can we assess the scenario, how stressful it is or not. These are also things we are doing at the moment to measure the stress in our scenarios and say, okay, this is really a stressful scenario versus maybe this is not working. Uh, for example, also Sebastian is always calling it stress cues. Also, things you are entering in this scenario to bring the people to stress. Because what we would like to have is that the police officer is stressed because otherwise we can't train decision making and acting in stress and there to see which stressors work. For example, I think in the requirements we will have it, but some things we, we found out is that if a dog is involved, mm -hmm. then it's exactly. always getting more stressful because a dog is something, something which I can't control. The people I can control more and never know what a dog is doing in this scenario or also in some scenarios we tried out the topic of, of children or babies in a scenario was also a high stressor for the police officers because it's always an, an unexpected behavior. It means always a, a danger for all in this scenario because you're really focusing. You're not focusing your opponent or uh, the situation. You're, for example, always looking in the corner to the little kid. Mm -hmm. And these are things we try out at the moment. And I think, Marcus, there's also like where yeah. another question came up, how similar the, the stimuli in VR from the from those from other kinds. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's actually something we are currently really, uh, from a scientific point, working on. Also, like as Marco said, with physiological measurement. But you can also you can already see that there are, let's say, some 
some stimuli is like like sounds, like talks in the in the VR scenarios, which really already invoke certain stress. Mm -hmm. And what you can also see from the behavior of the people, and if they're going to scenarios where there is some shooting involved, that they get really very, uh, let's say, very calm, or not, not very calm, but very um, cautious, right? So it's not like that they just run around and then go around the corner without our being, I don't know, in, in, uh, in the, the right movement whatsoever. So they really take care because they know that there could be something and they take it serious, right? So I think we really are at the point where this is a, uh, works pretty well yeah for most of the stimuli um, perhaps one also in addition to the question of Marcus answered about the training centers right I think it's not like that you have a centralized training setup because I mean you all what, what, what let's say what our aim in the beginning and I think still is you have to think how you can complement for instance scenario training if you have scenario training nowadays then you typically have um, a police training center where you can do that but you can do that for a street patrol officer once a year, perhaps twice a year, so one or two days. Yeah. If you have VR training, and I think, I mean, if you, at a certain point in time, probably not now, but we will get to a point where it's it's getting rather cheap to have it. Yeah. If you have more training centers, then it's not that you overall save a lot of money, but you can train more often, and by training more often, you improve the quality of the, uh, of, of the, of the training. And I think that's the way we want to go, right? Mm -hmm. To improve, quality of training by being are uh, more often able to train. Mm -hmm. I think this is really the way to go. And that definitely goes a bit off having large centers. I mean, large centers are also cool, good to have, because then you can have more fidelity. But for the two person, two person police officer team, four person police officer team, I would really see as a vision to have such uh, training centers, small training centers, very, very densely around uh, around the country to be more often able to, to, to use them. Absolutely. I think also at the moment, like the police in North and West Venia, uh, yes. uh, there's also the topic to integrate these trainings in the academies. I think this is also the way, where, where, like you mentioned, the police officers are there for one week per year yes. and then to integrate in the VR. Maybe the, the last question I, I, I will answer in, 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 um, um, in, on, on this slide is, I think there was the question for the factors and also for the human factors. Maybe some examples. Also, we see the human factors, first of all, very broad in our proposal. There was ideas, and this is what we're doing at the moment. Uh, for example, we change environmental factors in the meaning of the complete same scenario in the day or night. And is there a difference between your behavior? Also, we think yes. This is our hypothesis. Yeah. Maybe also from the ethical point of view, you change your opponent. Maybe it's getting older, it's getting younger, um, but it's the same situation and it's the same artifact. Also the police officer has 100% the same information, but we just changed the avatar and would like to know, is there now a difference in decision making and acting? So one of the ideas was also to change the complete context. You have the same scenario, for example, in a very nice house in the suburbs, and then you have the same situation uh, in a very bad district are in, 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 in something like in ghetto. Also, yes, we think so from the natural point of view, but this is also human behavior. And this is also the context gives you information, which is okay for us. But what we also would like to know is if you really see the artifacts. And with artifacts, I mean little hints in the scenario, uh, which can help the police officers to make decisions. So for example, if he is entering the, the flat, he sees in the corner uh, uh, a strolling, uh, our first question is, does he see the trolley or not? Yeah. Stroller. Stroller. Thank you for the kids. Uh, and then, is this an, an hint for him that maybe in this scenario a kid could appear or not? And I think these are the interesting things also from your view. Uh, what is influencing? What is, and also maybe one of the human factors which we are also interested in is the age of the police officers. Is there a different behavior of a very well experienced police officers with 25 years on duty versus a young cat? And these, I think, are the interesting human factors behaviors because from these we can learn and we can generate new trainings. And is there a different training in for the cadets versus the well experienced police officers? Yeah. I hope this helps a little bit. Yeah. It's always not so easy to read the, the small questions, but I think some of them we answered. 
maybe to your last yeah, point. Let's just go to my last point. I think they're pretty straightforward. I mean, cable-free navigation, movement abilities, I think, of course, that's uh, it's straightforward. That's absolutely needed. So if you have something which cabling whatsoever, which you can stumble on, you know, don't 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 believe if they tell you that that's working. Yeah, this is. <laughs> I, mean, I think it's interesting because we talked there a lot. Of, um, I think this cable-free navigation and this movement ability is for the training which we mention, and especially for the scenarios, very important. Yeah. Because sometimes you see systems where you can only do. Oh, really, I saw the last time only sitting for the desktop, and okay, having the R classes, but doing everything from sitting, and it was more an training simulator for maybe law. Uh, this was not our approach. Also, we are really going to this free movement because especially like you mentioned in your point one, the multiplayer, because then it's getting interest. So like you said, uh, that the proximity mean? between, oh, I always stand one back, you know, yeah. with COVID the proximity is always getting uh, a little bit uh, difficult. <clears throat> but I think this is really an interesting point and there's our finding absolutely here. Let's go to cable free navigation, enable the movement because it has a really important point to the immersion. And this immersion that you feel after three or five minutes really in the VR. Because okay. you, you said it so nice. Also, I also saw videos from the different studies, and this was really for me very positive. Uh, when the police officers was in the VR, within some minutes, they was really in the VR. Also, you see it from the movements, it was really like when you're doing a normal training or also a normal situation, that it was really the corners, everything was a really a slow move and tactical move. And this was also for me a personal yeah. point of view and an evidence that it's working and that it's not like ah, I'm in the VR and everything is funny. So it was really the training they normally have in the tactical training, really then also in the VR. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think exactly this tactical movement is a very good example, which you can directly see if you see people training in VR. I mean, what we also saw, <clears throat> and it's a bit important, it's important. And I think is that that's something which is perhaps nowadays, from a technological point, not perfect yet, to have spatial and realistic audio, right? In terms of spatial audio, in order to identify where <clears throat> the sound is coming from, where are my colleagues, where is something else happening. So I think that's something which is currently not contained, but would be extremely helpful. And I think their technical development definitely is, is still needed. On the other hand, I mean, I, that's what I already mentioned, right? This role player character, where you have an avatar, which where a trainer can speak through the avatar or can even play the avatar. So I think that's that makes it extremely versatile, right? Because like as said before, we don't have yet this AI which controls avatars automatically reacts to the uh, to the to the actions of the trainee whatsoever. We don't have that yet, and therefore such a role player character is really important. And if you have this one, or you have the ability in a VR system to have this one then you can do our, also this training of communication skills extremely well. Mm -hmm. If you don't have that, if you don't have a role player or somebody which can talk to, through the avatar, then for instance, communication de-escalation training gets very different. Mm -hmm. And perhaps one, one last our answer to a question which was mentioned also here. <clears throat> um, if we think that VR training will replace real world training in, our, in a certain point in time, to, from the knowledge I have now, I would say no, it's not possible. I, I don't. I don't see it. I, I, don't, I don't think it's meaningful, right? You will have real-world training where you train with colleagues, and I mean also perhaps one one example of, uh, with shooting here, right? Doing real-world shooting you cannot do in VR, and that's something which is perhaps not very often trained, very often necessary. But if you want to do that, you have to do it in real-world training. Then also combat training where you interact with other people. That's something which I don't see in VR. Yes. Maybe I can come to two questions from our audience. Sure, sure. Um, the one question was regarding the scenarios and how we would make it that they can be shareable. So yes, this is really, I will call it my vision, our vision. Uh, so we have it in a similar project in the military area. There is really the topic of to create uh, of, of course, you have different hardware, you have different systems, you have Unity, you have like in our system a completely own development. I think there must be an, an regulation, as otherwise it will not be possible. This is also, for example, one of our or one of the goals from the European Union to us, because we have to write policy and recommendation reports for the uh, on the one hand for the defense agency, but also for the whole security topic. And there would be one recommendation to create this 
uh, like APIs that you have the possibility to share it easily. Yeah. Maybe they will be hosted by Cpol, for example, exactly. and, and, con <laughs> and content platform where you can transfer this. But yes, at first you need this standardization. Without standardization, I will not see any possibility. Yeah. And yes, this is not a goal for the next 12 months. This will much more be a goal for the for the next five years. And yes, we discussed the same in the military area, and there they have now the need. And yeah. now in the military area, you really say, if you're doing something with VR, there should be a standard, there should be a documentation, and yes, maybe different hardware, but the content should be almost as possible on one platform. And yes, a challenge for the future, but you need challenges. Also, this is also our job from the research perspective. So I think it's a quite interesting um, topic. And also the question of a, of a mobile system. Yes, I think a mobile system is absolutely fine and okay. Also, always means what, what is mobile. But also, for example, the system we use from Relion in, in, in our studies and in, in short pros is also a mobile system. It's really mobile. Right? Also, you can come with the, with a small truck and some boxes and have there all the equipment and you can build it up because I think this was also a question. You can uh, build it up in a factory, but you can also go outside. Yeah. Also maybe we will also send afterwards a YouTube link to the Relay on system. Also just that you get a feeling of, yes, you can train outside. I also think this was the other question to the factors. I also think this is <coughs> one of the points where we are interested. What makes, also makes it a difference, for example, if you train in a, in a hall, in a in a nice office, also because of the weather, of the climate, or if you are going outside and you're really training in the cold. And I think, especially for the future, yes, everything is possible and should be maybe also possible because it's maybe a different behavior. Also, now I have just the hypothesis, but if it's minus 10 degrees, of then it's, it's and, and and you have a scenario from, for example, from our Swedish colleagues, then you have minus 10 degrees and completely different decision making maybe. Um, otherwise, when you are, for example, uh, in Greece and they have 25 degrees and everything is sunny, because I also think this natural, or I mentioned it as environmental factors, has also an influence of the behavior. And this is also one of the, of the input factors for our human factors model. Also where we say it's maybe not always the human, it can also be the environmental. Yeah. I hope this helps a little bit from, from our point of view. I will jump. Sure, go ahead. You know, always interrupt me. I mean, we talked a lot about these objectives. This is really just on the one hand, a little bit of summary. I, I think I had a lot of in, in the answers. Uh, what I think, and also maybe for you interesting when we have finished our, our documents is really this validated human factors model. Where really, this is our goal where we see which factors influence decision making and acting, mm -hmm. how you can train them. This will be a, a really large part of, of the webinar of Raul. Um, also, how, how decision and making and acting correlates with the performance. As I also think, and, and this is maybe, also, Raul, I think is there really the expert, but this was also an interesting point for us to discuss. Also, we always say improve the performance and make decision because this was also a lot of questions we received in the in the past month was what is a good or not good decision mm -hmm. where we say from the from the perspective nowadays it's always better to make a decision and to do nothing because there are a lot of studies in this topic of paralyzing and so i think the more danger is you're doing nothing and what we will not do in short pro is to evaluate if it was a good decision or not it was a decision but it's more the trainee and the trainer has to, to decide exactly. and to discuss absolutely exactly. yeah. because it's so difficult. And but I think that's and that's let's say one of the added values we see in VR training. But I mean we don't want to focus only on VR, right? The decision making and acting training. Yeah. But you you must have the ability to do to make errors. And I think but I, that's also what I learned. Uh, fortunately, that in 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 police in police training, um, doing failures, doing errors is fine, right? Because you learn out of them, and I think that's pretty important. And of course, you have more abilities to do um, failures and errors for dangerous situations if you have this in a VR situation than you have in real world situation. Yeah. Uh, so that's a that's a natural thing. But I think this is really important to to do actions, to take decisions, and to learn if you did wrong. And then, Absolutely. But to under, to understand if it's right or wrong, exactly this this joint decision between trainee and trainer that's important. Yeah. And be, because it can be a, 
good decision and maybe not legal also, or maybe an ethical issue and this is where I really say this is part of the training but not part of shot or not part of the of the system per se because it's so difficult to decide this and i also think and this is was one of my ideas behind shot pros in the beginning it's also from the trainee part because when he's in the in in, in the after review meeting seeing his behavior and mm. seeing his decision that he can say on his own this was right or this was not right or this was correct or not correct but it's the self-learning and i think this is one of for me one of the biggest advantages of the vr because i review everything from my myself yeah. also maybe just one sentence also i think in some weeks we, we will have raul here on this position um they're doing also a lot of training in, in the area of professional football players and this is also very similar to the topics we discussed today because also there the football players learn a lot about their own behavior mm -hmm. and also about vr training and decision making because it's very similar sometimes to the stress level of police officers also when you're playing in a football stadium with 100,000 people and everyone is shouting and crying and you know that the, 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 the next pass will decide over 10 million euros in the champions league then it is a quite interesting point and also there we take knowledge for this decision making and acting process and i think there we can really have a high benefit on the um on the next issues um just some of our ideas and like i mentioned the next webinars we will go deeper and deeper uh because that is too much for today but also for the vr reality what we know at the moment or what is important yes we discussed a little bit the, uh, the scenarios i think what we are also working on at the moment is this manipulation during the scenarios this is for example also one of the biggest advantages i see in the vr because you have the trainer and the trainer can immediately change the scenario maybe one more stress cue can maybe put the dangerous or the, 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 the risk situation higher or lower and this is also quite interesting because you can do much more manipulation like in a real world training you can let there have an, an, an baby yeah. Also, this was yeah. one example from our layers where they could never train with a baby with a dog or something like this but of course in a vr you can change these situations very easily very fast the nice thing of measurements uh, measure performance during the stress i also think this is for, for us one of the interesting points in the next 18 months to see is there a correlation between stress and the training and how we can influence it how we can raise the immersion and also how we can use these data um, uh, for the rebriefing. Yeah. yeah, because I think in that respect, it's really important also to see it, to understand. And I think that's a measurement, right? Yeah. If you know where your, where your trainees are looking at, and I think that's also important for the trainer, because then also in the, together with the trainee, but also for the trainer itself, he sees in the scenario immediately where the people are looking at, and he can see if they are beha behaving wrong, right? So if somebody's not looking at in, in one corner anyways, right? So there could come another artifact, right? If they are not looking there at all. Mm -hmm. So you, that's, I think it's lot, like lots mm -hmm. of improvement also for the trainer to understand or to, to see how he can then manipulate uh, the scenario to make it in an even bit more stressful situation. Yeah? Absolutely. And then, then I, I mean, what we're also doing now is like to see, okay, with eye tracking, because now mm -hmm. we can only uh, track the head movements. We know where the people are looking with the head swords. But if you now can also include eye tracking, then we really exactly know where they're looking at. And I think that's uh, extremely interesting for this after action review, but also like for the trainer to see where they're looking at. Yeah. And this is also uh, because you mentioned the eye tracking. I think this is quite interesting for us in the next month. Also, to, the questions are, what does the trainer trainee see? Does it really see and interpret it? Also, for example, the, 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 easy, the easy question, there's one knife in the room. In a scenario does he see the knife and if he sees it uh, does he react or act to it yeah. and also in the rebriefing then the question did you see the knife uh, yes and then you really have the measurement and no you never looked on the table in the kitchen and this is also for us quite interesting as an experience factor for future development of scenarios because then you can say in this scenario really train this there was issues, there was problems, and this brings us also to the topic of sharing knowledge. Because I think it's senseless if every country gained the same experience and the same issues with our scenario 10 is not working. Also, this should be an, an, a knowledge transfer where we say these are problems because, yeah, we are talking about a new technology, 
we're talking about the technology which is really growing every year, also from the possibilities, also from the additional technologies. You mentioned it, artificial intelligence, AI. Also this is, a, when you ask me for a dream, and this was one of our dreams in the, in, in the early beginnings, then you say you have, for example, an, an, an human factor based real-time training development in the meaning of the whole scenario is adopting to your uh, biosignals, behavior, decisions. But yes, this is a little bit future. And this is more for, you said it, not five years. Let's talk about in 10 years. Another decade ago. Yeah. But I think it's also quite interesting to discuss such points because really in the beginning, a lot of people told me, ah, and AI, and we can use this. They say, let's, let's stay in the reality and let's try, for example, the best things we can out from the from the VR training. Here, for example, you see a picture and Valerie will send out the YouTube link. Uh, yes, you can train, for example, with the Relion system. Here's a very large hall, but you can also uh, go outside. You can have the training where you want, so it's mobile. And I think this is one of the advantages. Maybe you also have to rethink uh, for, for establishing uh, a VR training. Um, the next slides are really just a little bit of what we will do in, in, in the next sessions. Also, yeah, we will jump very, very well and very, very deep in the development of the training framework in the meaning of what is interesting, what is important, what are the points we need. And there we will Raul talk a little bit about it. And maybe I jump to this slide. This is one of my last slides for today because for me it's very important, especially if we have here the, the European or worldwide community um, if you are interested in share knowledge, also we are also happy to receive your feedback or your, existing. your experiences. Yeah, if, absolutely. If, if there's somebody uh, in this webinar which has already tried out VR, and it, your experience, I think that would be extremely helpful for us if you could join into into a discussion and to exchange that. And I think also like our layer partners here, which which have the, uh, would also be extremely happy to see. Okay, if there are other um, law enforcement agencies which have already engaged in VR training and what your experiences were, where, where do you see benefits, disadvantages, what so on. So if you have these kind of experience, feel free to contact Marcus or me. We would be really happy to get your feedback on, on that, uh, on your experiences here. Absolutely, because I think it makes much easier. So I hope the technical issues are solved. So, sorry, you know, sometimes the technology like electricity is, is disturbing a topic of VR. Uh, but thank you very much for the feedback. No, I really think it makes sense. Also, also if there are possibilities to talk with you half an, half an hour over video conference or phone, also because of course we have the six European countries within our project, but like you mentioned with the Stadtpolizei Zürich, yeah. also we are also doing a lot outside of the project. At the moment we are discussing, discussing issues with the Belgian police. I, I had, for example, with the Denmark police, a, a, a lot of discussions. And I think this is quite necessary. Yeah to collect this information, to collect your experiences, because what really our aim is at the end of our project is to have there the status quo of virtual reality, also to have a little bit a roadmap, where should it go, also discuss it with some management levels within the European Union, to discuss this with some large organizations like Interpol, CEPOL, uh, for example, Sebastian and I was, I think it's now half a year at the OSCE. Yeah. Also there, the discussion of VR and training for all of the OSCE countries. And so I think together it's much easier and to put the, 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 the contents on the table and to create yeah. the best of it. And perhaps also to get that a bit more into the, let's say, Europol and CEPOL. I mean, for CEPOL, I think we have very good uh, connections already, but also I think it would be really interesting to get that also in Europol or even into Interpol, right? Because like at the OSCE, mm -hmm. OSCE meeting, we had the discussion like with the, the vice president of Interpol. And I mean, we are in current exchange, but if somebody, if you is aware of, of some, uh, let's say, activities there, then feedback would be great and we would be happy to share our um, experience as well. Right? Absolutely. And the big advantage of us is we are researchers and do not sell anything. Exactly. So we are really interested in, in your experiences and in the points which are interesting. Maybe at the end, and thank you very much that you stayed so long with us. Um, this was five learnings I had in the project. I think it's similar to Sebastian. Um, the first of all, what I really learned, even we are doing it always, but I think especially in this context is put the users in the center really put the police officers in the center. What is for your organization the most important things in the meaning of 
which actual training plans do we have? Can we change the training? I had this discussion, for example, for some weeks with a Scandinavian organization where they said, okay, they would like to introduce VR, but they have no possibility to change training plans. Yeah. Then it's for me, for me a little bit a problem. Also, yeah. okay, then I have a technology, but what I'm doing with this technology, yeah. this is like an, an UFO is landing in front of my garden, but I have no manual what to do with it. Yeah, Michael, I think that's a very, very valid point. That's also what, what we, what I saw not only in, uh, in this police project, but also in the military, right? If you have a training doctrine, you have to make sure that this training doctrine is also adapted, right? Yeah. Just by purchasing a VR, uh, VR training system, which is great and can do everything. If you don't change your training doctrine, I think that then you have an issue, right? So you really have to think also about changing your training process and the training plan training mm -hmm. curriculum in order to really uh, use the benefits of, of virtual reality training. So that's also something which you should not forget, right? It's not only about purchasing a system, but it's also about changing your general uh, approach to training. Yeah. Absolutely. The next point is a little bit similar to this topic of collecting needs and requirements. And what I would like to stress out is really from several perspectives. Also, it's also the financial perspective. It's the management perspective. It's also the technology perspective. Also, for example, who will be responsible for the system? Who will be responsible for the content? Will you develop, I heard it from some police organizations, they are developing the scenarios on their own. Others are uh, buying them. But I think this is quite interesting at the beginning of talking about VR. Where creates the content? Uh, who is seeing that this content is correct? Yeah. As in some countries, we have, for example, an ethical check and legal check. Are there any issues? But also the contracts with the companies. So I think it's really necessary to have all these needs and requirements from these different stakeholders. And all along to this, to have an implementation plan. What is really the goal? Is it just an one system in one country? As I like the question with the centers, or maybe we are starting in, in, in more police stations. What is important, what we would like to train? Like Sebastian, you mentioned with the different possibilities. Yeah. Because we really often get the question, can we train with VR the accuracy of shooting? They say, no. Also, this is also not the goal, also because you have problems, of, you have your glasses on, you cannot measure the accuracy. These are maybe things you still do in the shooting range. But what is really the implement, implementation plan? What is really the goals from your side? And my personal wish always share knowledge within and outside the community. I also think this was very interesting for our six organizations from the law enforcement side we have in the project, because they are always discussing these issues with different countries, with different Bundesländer. And I think this is so necessary because everyone has different opinions, experiences on their own, tried out the system. Also, I think we tried out over eight or nine systems in the last month and just to get this experience and to share this. And I think the last point also for today is we, I'm, but I hope you, you also the opinion, that VR training can really enhance the training of police, but it does not replace it. It's not the future that you will not have, no police academies, no real world trainings. It's always the balance. And yes, VR can support. VR can support in very uh, common topics, in special topics. It has a big advantage, but we must be always aware that it will never kill the existing training. It's just a plus yeah. with the dimension benefits. Uh, but it's always playing together real training and VR training. And I think this was from my side uh, the last sentence. Do you have anything to add, Sebastian? Um, perhaps like just one thing to add, and I think that's something we discussed not, not too much today is the topic of, uh, I mean, because like we also get this, let's say, asked very often, right? VR training, how is it about like getting cyber sickness, right? That's yeah. something we didn't address. And that's uh, cyber sickness is something similar, like if you're on a ship and you, you, get, um, you get seasick, right? And I mean, that happens, right? But we saw it with the trainings when people got a bit used to the system and they really got into the training and didn't, um, let's say, put their, um, their, their their view on any slight disbalances in the, in the VR whatsoever, then they, we didn't have big issues, right? I would say between um, one to 5% of the people had some issues, but only one or 2% of the trainees had real, real problems with yeah. any any training, not not being able to train due to cyber sickness. So <laughs> there's a topic coming up often. I do, I don't think it's a it's a big issue. And I mean there are also still some let's say advance advances in technology and the development, how scenarios are created to make that better, right? So I think 
if you're asking you this question, is cyber sickness is a problem, I would say currently I don't see it's a big problem. So that would be just my last sentence because the rest was summarized very well um, with, with Marcus. Um, I've just seen that there have been some um, questions in terms of how you can contact us um, from Scott. Um, perhaps you can just pull in your email and I mean, ah, Marcus brought it oh, up. Perfect. Oh, much faster. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> faster. Just, just uh, go on the web page. Uh, there you find our email addresses. You can contact us. Feel free to send emails. Uh, and then we engage directly in, in a call or whatsoever. So I think that's uh, pretty straightforward. Anyways, we're used to all these virtual conferencing now and these COVID situations, right? Yeah. So that's it from my side. Maybe. Also, thank you very much, Scott. If this would be possible, this would really help us. Yeah. Uh, because we have a little bit connections to the UK as one of our advisors is, is from Scotland. There we had a little bit and, and, and transferred to the, to the UK police and point of view. But every experience really helps us. I also think in the beginning our email addresses from Sebastian and mine is. Um, and I think there was also one question, if we are developing the VR platform. Also, who, it, it, it's difficult, it's yes and no. Also, Shotpros was not set up as a technology project. Yeah. The first question was much more, how should a platform look like to be the best for VR training in the police? What is important? What are the guidelines? What is the validated model? And so we are not really, also Relion is of course integrating all our wishes in their system. Uh, and I think this could be one possibility, but the main goal was not to have a final, because maybe just also for you to know, we are, we are a research project. Our goal at the end is gathering research knowledge and to have a way how to go to the optimal technology platform for VR but it's not part of the project to really have a final market ready platform. This was what I mean with we're not selling anything. We are yeah. only talking about our knowledge and spreading the word. Um, so at the moment, we are not really developing a final platform, but of course there will be possibilities, especially from our partners. And also if you visit our, web, <coughs> our website, you'll also see that there's the company, as Marco mentioned before, Relyon already. And from Relyon, you can, you can get also videos of their existing platform, which is not mm -hmm. yet police platform but yeah you can get videos videos from that absolutely maybe also one interesting question if there's any possibility to jump in in our project uh unfortunately not also this was also what i learned as so i never had such an as i'm doing now 20 years research project as if you do well let's say 10 years we are not getting sold uh uh because uh the, the, if the projects are funded from the european union the consortium is closed but what we are trying is really, also this was the idea a little bit of this network because a lot of organizations asked us, how can we stay in contact? How can how we get involved? For instance, Stadt Polizei Zürich, right? I mean, they are not part of the, of the Shot Plus project itself, yeah. but we, got, we, we found a way to engage with them and to, uh, to share our knowledge and to get their knowledge in terms of the VR training and we could participate in their training sessions, right? So we, yeah. found, we always find a way. So please feel really free to, to engage with us. And as Marcus mentioned, I mean, the idea of the project was also to have this network, to have a vivid network where we can exchange experiences. And the network, entering the network is definitely possible and we, are, we want you in the network, right? So that's, please, 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 <laughs> we get you in and we exchange, uh, we exchange information and uh, experiences. No, absolutely. As I think this was really the network idea to, to get more organizations on board, yeah. also to share knowledge because, for example, then we need a non-disclosure agreement. And this is the reason why we have this, this, this network around our short pros. And what we are also, uh, in, in reality, it was planned for this year, but you know, we all had this, this sort of COVID topics. Uh, to have also a personal uh, day, this was planned at Campus Vesta. Now we plan it for, for spring next year to be there um, and to demonstrate there our existing system from Relion also to present some other studies we have in detail and also to discuss because I think the most important thing for the VR topic is to try it out yeah. and to live with it. And this was also the reason why we now switch to webinars uh, because we're not allowed to travel. We have not the possibility to organize such nice events, but I think, I think Valerie is still organizing and trying because there was really the idea next year to have this one training day in Belgium where we really set up our system and there have a demonstration day and which what is also planned and fixed within short pro COVID is always the issue. Uh, at the end of the project in the year 22, there we will have a, a large conference about the topic virtual reality. 
and police. And there we will also show them the final results of the whole system. And also there, of course, everyone is invited from the from the organizations because I really think try these things out. Get your own experience and also your own op opinion. Also, yeah. this have the feeling in the VR. And I think the the last question was, do we record the webinar? Yeah, we we we, we record the webinar and we can send out the link. Then you can rewatch it or share it with your colleagues. This is of course possible. Then from my side, I say thank you very much for your time. I hope it was quite interesting for you. So we really tried to get in the, the practical point of view. If there are any questions, Valerie, Sebastian and me, always there and we are always very interested in discussions also for our research future yeah. in the area Absolutely. of VR. Absolutely. Also, thanks from my side. Thanks also for your questions that you put in questions because I think that makes it a bit more interactive and we're not just talking to an audience we do not, we do not see and I hope we could answer. Um, answer your questions well, and if you have more questions, as already said, then just approach us. We are happy to to engage. Thank you so much, Thank and best wishes much. from Vienna, and have a nice day all around the world. Thank you, and bye. Stay safe. Bye.